Awesome. I think it's time. Um, so before we get started, um, I wanted to know if any of you got to attend the Decouple Summit yesterday? Okay, I see some hands. Um, well, we had a panel discussion on these topics. Uh, I'm going to touch on some different things. I'm going to go a little bit in more depth in some topics. Some others I will not because that panel was an hour and 45 minutes. And uh, we're not going to go that long again. <clears throat> so, hello, welcome. This is your first DrupalCon presentation. I love this a lot. Uh, there's a lot of energy after the Drew's note, always. So I will ride on that wave, and hopefully I will keep that going. Um, so I'm, I'm Matteo. Um, I've been doing decoupled projects uh, for a while now. I think that I started in 2013, and I've been doing those. Uh, I like them, and I'm lucky enough that I was able to get on those projects. And uh, thanks to, to Lullabot um, as well, I've been able to contribute a lot of code in the, in the community to help like, build projects like JSON API or the solutions that we're going to talk today. They are all backed by Drupal modules that I was able to, to write because of two things, because Lullabot sponsors my time, partly, and because um, we are a distributed company and I don't have to wait in a bus to get to work, right? So I can do this stuff. And I guess that the community benefits from that. So uh, if you want to appreciate that, maybe consider dropping by the booth and talking to us about your next project. Uh, that would be awesome. Um, apart from that, um, I'm a, an API First Initiative Coordinator, um, along with Wimliers. Uh, you may have heard about the initiative in the keynote uh, or read in, in Drupal.org. Um, we are trying to make all these cool things that we saw earlier happen. Um, so, yeah, please come and contribute. Uh, apart from that, uh, last DrupalCon we talked about getting a new Drupal distribution uh, with decoupled in mind. And so, uh, I built Contenta with, uh, along with Daniel Weiner and some other contributors to the project. So, all right, that out of the way, uh, the actual content of the, of the presentation. So we're going to talk about uh, five, uh, or, um, five different hard problems uh, here. There are more. Uh, yesterday's panel was a big proof of that, and we're going to just mention some of those at the end. Um, but these are the ones that I wanted to talk about because these are the ones that uh, have been taking my time in this last year. And uh, I've been writing some Drupal modules to ease the problems of those. So uh, we're going to be talking about performance, about schemas, why they are important, and how they are uh, massively difficult to generate, uh, routing, and then editorial layouts and authentication um, by the end. So again, uh, as usual, there is a Drupal module for that. So, uh, yeah, hopefully we can keep that going. The first hard problem is performance, right? When you start a decouple project, um, you may not see that right away. And that is because, at least in HTTP 1 or 1.1 projects, uh, you have the need of sequential requests, right? Um, JSON API greatly improves in that, in the sense that you can include entities in the response so you can save yourself that work. But sometimes it's unavoidable, and sometimes it's not just getting a um, set of entities and uh, doing some includes. Sometimes it's more like you want to create an article, right? Um, and imagine that you have a React application with a form, and that form is submitting some, some data. And uh, ultimately, what you want to create is an article with a bunch of tags, and, uh, and that's it. To do that, you create the JSON object that you need to push to the server, and you realize, oh, but I need the tag IDs. For this, for this article, right? If I want to add some tags to it, so I need to create the tags first in order to get the ideas. And also I need to get the 
user ID based on the username, so I can put it in the JSON body first. And uh, that becomes a set of sequential requests, so you can get first the the user ID and the vocabulary ID. When you have the vocabulary ID, you can create the two tags. When you have the two tags, you can fetch the IDs from there and you can actually create the article. So this is very painful. It's like you can do the first two in parallel, then the, the second two in parallel, and then the third, sorry, the, the fifth. Uh, but that's assuming, and this is like a, one of the key concepts that um, I want you to walk out the room with. That's assuming that you are thinking about a particular consumer that can do things in parallel. So in the coupled in the coupled land, sometimes you don't get that luxury. Uh, there are technologies that don't have an event loop like the browser does. There are like, for instance, if you had a consumer that's uh, Symfony application, you cannot do things in parallel. So that's uh, your assumption is that. You, you have to get into the lowest common denominator. And also think about all of the requests that you need to coordinate. You need to, don't try to read the, the code. This is just for kind of an, an example. Um, the, this highlights though the complexity of doing this very simple task of posting an, an article. You need to coordinate three levels of requests. Uh, each one of those has a bunch of parallel requests and you need to handhold all that process and you don't need to do it across multiple consumers at the same time. And as we talked about late, uh, before, each consumer ca can have its own ideas on how to make requests and if they can be parallelized or not, right? So this code needs to be repeated and variated in each consumer. Instead, what we want is to do something like this, right? Something that it's very simple, it's a simple request that deals with all of that. Because ultimately, what we are doing is we're going back and forth with the server and the client just to fill in an ID. And that's a very simple task that a, a machine should be able to do. So that's why I got the idea to build the sub-requests module to make the server do it. So the idea is that you create a, a JSON document, which is called a blueprint, that contains a description on how to make all those requests. Basically, it's just the request that you would do minus the IDs, because you don't know them, right? So you put all those into a JSON document, and wherever you have the ID that you're missing, you put a placeholder. The placeholder says, grab the ID from this previous response, right? So you're Telling the, you're telling the server, do all these requests, and then grab information from those and fill them for me. Don't, don't come back to me to just put an ID in a JSON document. So it's a very simple idea, and uh, it goes like this. And again, don't try, to, don't try to read it, you probably won't be able to, but, uh, oh, that's sad. Uh, it's color coded, but it's not showing very well. Well, the, the first two sections, hopefully you can see that there are five sections in there. Um, so those are the five requests that we're making. And the first two are the ones that you start off. They don't have any dependency on other requests. You start making them right away. So the second two are gonna, they have a key at the end that say wait for, and then they're waiting for the vocabulary request. So what that is expressing is that I have in my request, I have a placeholder that depends on the response to one previous request. So it's gonna wait for those, replace that, and, um, and it's gonna happen all in the server. So you can specify using this format, you can specify the requests as you would do them in the in the consumer, you can specify uh, in a way that you can have placeholders to create uh, your, <clears throat> your request for you. So ultimately what we are aiming for is to make a single request to the server, so there's only one, uh, there's only one back and forth between the server and the consumer to make all these requests that Drupal can do internally in the server. So that improves performance greatly and also has the, the added benefit that 
since it's a single request, it is going to be the same code or the same principle across all of the consumers. Because it becomes, uh, the problem becomes generating this, this blu blueprint and having the placeholders, and that's going to be the same thing across the board, because it's going to be interpreted in the server. So that works really well, uh, when, especially when these internal requests take advantage of things like page cache. It's really fast. Like we are resolving requests in under three milliseconds. And three milliseconds is pretty fast. So that's it for the first one. That's, uh, that's performance. And uh, sub requests will help a lot. And I um, also want to mention oh, great, they are showing here the notifications. Well, hopefully, no one will. I definitely turned those off. <laughs> Do not disturb is now on. OK. All right. Cool. Uh, sorry about that. <laughs> schemas. Uh, we were talking about schemas. Um, no, actually, I was mentioning that the sub request module that is implemented in Drupal, I also implemented in Node.js. So uh, the thing is that you can now have it in Drupal or in Node.js, if you have a, a proxy Node.js application, which you probably will end up with, uh, you can use it there too. Um, and, and yeah, um, just try it out and leverage it, and uh, hopefully it will help your, your performance and maintain, maintainability. So let's talk about schemas, right? Uh, I didn't write the schemata module, uh, I only helped writing the JSON API integration of the Schemata module. Um, but why do we want schemas and what are they good for? So schemas are basically a description of the shape of a JSON document. So imagine that a backend developer and a frontend developer uh, go into a bar. And this is not a joke. Um, so imagine that they go and go for a coffee, right? And the backend developer is trying to uh, explain the, the frontend developer, oh, I'm working in this API, and you're going to get JSON documents. So the JSON document is going to look like it's, it has a data property, and inside of that, it has a, an attributes key and a relationships key. And if it's an article in the attributes key, you're going to have a title that's going to be a string that's going to be 255 characters long max. And you're going to have a body key that has a value and then the long text in there. So that description, that exact description, is what the schema is, right? Uh, we are describing the shape of the document using a machine, uh, a machine format, or a format that a machine can understand that's called JSON schema. And very importantly, this is a standard. And by a standard, I mean that uh, other platforms and other software understand this format and can do cool things about it. So by using a schemata and the JSON API integration with that, what we are empowering is creating documentation. Because what I just, uh, the analogy that I just made is, uh, is a backend developer documenting verbally the shape of the API and how to use the API. But by having a software do this, we can just generate beautiful web apps that document your API for free. And let's stop a second to realize that. So you download Drupal, you download JSON API, um, Schemata, and, and the Open API module, and you get for free for your content model and a fully fledged API that you can do a lot of stuff. And it's totally documented. And not only that, you create a new field, and that gets documented as well, like magically. Well, no, it's not magically. Yeah. <laughs> It's actually shop software. But it gets documented, and it's up to date. It doesn't get stale. You don't have to do anything to do it. And uh, it's accurate, right? So that's one, of the, that's one of the benefits of having schemas. But that's not the only one, because by describing the shape in a standard and, uh, and uh, in a way that a software can understand it, we can do things like generating forms. Um, imagine that you have your. Um, Ember app or your iOS app, 
right? You want to create a form for that article that um, I was making the analogy for. So the iOS app can download the schema, can see the, okay, this is a title, so I'm gonna put the label title. This is a string, so I'm gonna generate a text field, and this is max 255, so I'm gonna make it uh, just not the text area, but the text field, right? And the same goes for body, etc. So you can end up with a software that reads a schema and generates a form for it automatically without no one having to type the HTML to do a form. And you may think that's pretty cool because I'm, I'm a software developer and I'm basically lazy in when it goes to write code. I want to reuse and uh, keep dry, etc. cetera. So um, that is very appealing to me. But then you realize that there is another factor that is more important than that. And that is that when you create a form, if you, if you don't use the techniques like this, what you end up with is that you have like maybe four consumers to your API, all of those have forms, and then you create a field, a new field in your content type, right? So now you need to deploy your API and update all the forms in all of the consumers and have a joint deployment so the API and the forms are all in line, right? If you do it with the schemas, the app just downloads the schema and pops up the new field in there, right? And that is very powerful because it allows you to decouple yourself from release, pro uh, from the re release workflow, right? Uh, you don't have to be like in sync for your deployments. Um, all the things that are good when, when you get schemas is like the client side validation. Uh, we got into the like uh, validation of 255 characters. You can do that into, in the client side. We have going to go to the server to do that validation, right? And throw that error. So that's better experience for, uh, for the admin team. Um, and then just the global concept of enhancing the user experience with this. So this is uh, a screenshot of, uh, of Contenta. Uh, out of the box, you get this automatic generation of schemas and that translates in automatic documentation based on the open API um, module. And it's very, it's very easy to use. Like it's actually just go into that page and start using. The problem here is that the shape of the API is pretty hard to guess, right? Um, we are talking about auto-generating these schemas, uh, and what we are really talking about is doing the best we can to guess the schema, right? Um, and I'm gonna say I'm gonna say why, right? Because um, but first I need to drink a little bit. It's a cliffhanger. All right, um, so the, the main problem here is that we are using Symfony uh, and the Symfony um, serialization component. And what that allows is for arbitrary code execution, which is good, right? Uh, it's what we wanted because uh, when you're uh, normalizing the Drupal entities, what you want to go from is like the uh, node object that you get when you do node load 42, right? It's a, it's a PHP typed object that you have, you can execute methods on and that it can actually save data to the database and it can load from the database. So uh, it's a PHP, in the PHP world, it lives in the PHP world. But we need to go from that, the data that represents a node, to a JSON object that can be a stream over the wire to a client, right? So it, it, the data, the node 42 lives in like two parallel dimensions, uh, one that is PHP only and one that is in serialized or text only, right, in JSON format. So the, the normalization component allows us to go from one to the other. And um, the problem is that it is too flexible. So you can have something like this, like a normalization function that uh, says, 
All right, so I'm loading a node and I'm gonna roll a die and if it's a five, I'm gonna output a string. And if it's not, I'm gonna output an integer. But your schema was saying all, all along that it was going to be an integer. But since you can override the normalizers that JSON API produces um, and REST core produces, you could do something like this, right? And there is no way that we can guess beforehand, like when, like two months ago, when you delivered the documentation to the developer, what the result of rolling a die would be, right? And it's, it has to be either a string or an integer. And there is nothing in our code base that prevents this. And this can become a problem. Also, um, when we talked about documentation, um, we didn't touch on this, but the shape is not enough to provide meaningful documentation. Things like, is this content type public through the API? Or can I delete this? Or uh, is this field uh, allowed to modify? Because there are fields that are auto-generated by Drupal, and you cannot modify them. You can read them, but you cannot create them. Right? So things like this are not available directly for, for our APIs. And uh, we want to document that because that's critical for uh, documentation. Knowing what, what you can do and how you have to do it is not only about the shape. So we have some ideas uh, in the API initiative. So the first problem is about uh, ensuring that the schema is accurate. And for that, um, I, I wrote a, a PHP library that ensures transformations in a type safe way. So we are going to uh, try to build a prototype that includes that into the JSON API normalizers. And we're gonna require everyone writing a normalizer to be type safe and declare, okay, this is the shape that this is gonna output. And that, that contract is what we're gonna use to generate the schemas. So we're gonna be sure that the output of our normalizers are what the schemas say. The other problem is a little bit more complex because uh, we kind of require a little bit of uh, coordination with uh, core teams to provide more metadata on what the API can do. And we, immediately we already have a bunch of this through the access system and the entity and field APIs. Uh, it contains some of that information, but sometimes we don't want to conflate the two things, what Drupal can do internally uh, as a system and when, what you want to expose to the world, right? So we need some sort of a wrapper on Entity API and Field API to declare this in a, in a way that it can be reused for the REST core, we can, it can be reused JSON API and maybe even GraphQL. So ultimately what it, this translates is that we get into the mindset that we are really API first and not just API compatible, which is kind of the, the situation that we are uh, currently. All right, so <clears throat> routing or routing, like my British friends like to say, um, is, is the next in, in the list. So I've been saying that you need to stop thinking about your React side as decoupled Drupal. Because uh, that is not only what decoupled Drupal is about, right? It's mostly about omni-channel situations or multi-channel situations where you have, uh, you have an API that drives different digital experiences. And that is, in many situations, what it drives the decision to move to decoupled Drupal. And probably why uh, many of you are here Right? Because you're building, I, I don't know, experiences that drive a React website, but also an iOS app and an Android app and uh, Apple TV, Roku, smartwatch, uh, even there are smart ovens and you can install apps on that. So um, you need to be mindful of this and that every decision that you make in the back end affects the front end. However, there are some uh, outstanding challenges to the, to the browser. And the browser is 
it's pretty important. I mean, uh, we've been building websites and now we are building websites and other things, right? But we're still building websites. And the browser has a, has a thing, and that is that it's driven by URLs. We run our web apps inside of browsers. Uh, we could say that it's our OS for, for web apps. And we need to be able to use the, the URL in an effective manner. And for that, Drupal has been like, very opinionated that content editors should be able to specify the URL for the content and for every web page. And that is fair because SEO, uh, that, uh, that concept affects SEO. And that is very important for many, uh, for the success of many businesses in the, in the digital world, right? So we really need this in the, in the decoupled landscape. And let me focus right now on the, on the browser for a second and break that rule that is not only about the React app, it will be for the next slides, right? So it, it is a, a need that you have to be able to uh, control editorially your, your URLs, right? You need to have like the, that SEO specialist uh, be opinionated on where your uh, routes will live. And um, whenever a request comes into your Vue.js app, it's going to take that path and it's going to inspect it and it's going to have to make a request to the Drupal backend. So one strategy that people have been following is to to do something like, I'm gonna create a property in my, in my node that is gonna be called path or a slug. And then I'm gonna filter that content type by that property and I'm gonna find what I'm looking for, right? And that works well, um, except when you realize that you go into this scenario. Like imagine that an editor creates a, a recipe for a recipe side and it puts it in the, recipes sliced bread, right? And uh, we are all very, very proud of that recipe and uh, share, the, share that in Facebook, Twitter, even put it in a printed magazine, that URL, and then comes uh, a change to that, right? And you drop the recipes prefix. So now, if you think about that solution that we came up with, when the request comes in, we have updated uh, to sliced bread and not recipes sliced bread. So the request comes in, but it comes in with the, with the old path because someone clicked on Twitter or on Facebook. So you look for the content that has that old path and you don't find it because you updated it, right? And it's no longer there. Um, and that is, that is very sad. And the SEO specialist is not pleased about it. Um, Especially when, you, when the magazine is printed and sold, right? Because uh, you cannot change that. So the idea is that you use the, uh, this module uh, called the couple router, router and uh, basically deals with this because this is an, uh, an old problem for the Drupal community. We solved this like a long time ago. Uh, you just use the URL alias and you download and enable the redirect module. And whenever there is a change on the, on the path alias, then it, a redirection gets created. And if you land on an old URL, you follow all the redirections throughout the changes until you land into the node that you're looking for. So the concept is the same. Um, there is a new endpoint when you download and install the decoupled router module. And to that, you pass the path and you just execute the, the request in, in Drupal. It comes back to you with the URL that you need to request. And I kind of dropped the, uh, the hint before, but if you see here, we kind of dropped the recipes prefix. The recipes prefix was what it was telling the Vue.js app look for a recipe that has this, uh, this path, sliced bread. If we drop that, we don't know if sliced bread, we need to filter on a taxonomy term. It, is it a 
a recipe? Is it an article? So we need to look for all of the resources to find that path. With the decouple router, however, you just pass a path and it resolves to any entity that is behind that. Right? You, don't, you don't even need to know what resources is it. So at this point, uh, hopefully someone in the audience is cringing about the idea of sending a path to Drupal to get the entity that you need to request in the client and then make another request to actually get the entity, right? Um, and you just build a blueprint to, to fix that, right? Because that's, that's the thing. When we work in these hard problems as an abstract concept, we find ourselves, whenever we crack the nut on, on one of the problems, that we find the old problems again. So we need to keep reusing the same, the same principles. So you send a blueprint that has the path resolution to the coupled router, and then it requests the entity uh, in there using the placeholder. So that makes two. Um, and uh, we're gonna move to editorial layouts and in-place editors. Um, this one is special. It's my least favorite of the hard problems because I feel that I feel that we are in a transitioning time, right? We are kind of new to decoupled Drupal or decoupled strategies. Um, and we are still dragging some of the feature sets of the old times, I feel. And building layouts in the server is one of those concepts. However, uh, that is something that some clients really need or think that they really need. And, uh, and we need to provide solutions for them, right? Um, what I would try is to teach them uh, how this is hard and how much this is gonna uh, be a problem, like maybe uh, development time or budget for it, etc. But some, they will still need this. And there are solutions. Um, like, this is a screenshot of uh, something that uh, the 1X internet people uh, showed at the Drupal Camp Roar this year. And this is what you would expect. Uh, it's not showing very well. But it has like an in-place layout builder. You drop blocks and you select them and you edit them and it's, it works really well. And it's both things. It's a layout builder and it's also the, and it's, and it's also the in-context experience that, uh, that editors really love. And there is a buff, um, I'm sure, Chris over here can, can say more about that later. Uh, and you go and, and watch that. Also, there is gonna be another session right after this one uh, in this room that is the uh, Moon Race project. Um, uh, it's the weather.com uh, layout builder experience for the couple projects. So this is real neat, uh, that's, that's what I'm saying. Uh, however, it is very uh, hard to generalize uh, from the API first initiative perspective because Drupal is everything to everyone at any given moment. And how, how do we do that, right? How do we provide a layout builder for, in context for every project? Um, that is just not possible because there is also another limitation and that is Again, what we were thinking about was about the React version of this. Uh, do we need to build a layout builder in context for all of the different consumers? Do we have to build five uh, layout builder experiences? Do we build one that is not in context? Uh, the answer is gonna be different for different projects. And what I really encourage you, and this is the second big takeaway of the of the session is that you need to leverage the constraints of your actual project to simplify. Because we're trying to build something that is really difficult. It's very impressive, but it's really difficult. We're trying to drive six, seven, ten different consumers 
digital experiences, if you allow me, with a single API. And we're trying to uh, leverage most of the work that we've done in one into the others, right? So you need to simplify. And if you have the ability to say, I'm okay, I'm only going to be building a website and I know that's not going to change because X, Y, and Z, then go ahead and build this if this, this suits you, right? But this raises a lot of questions, like um, how, how is the layout that I just built with my front end for the web in mind showing my smart open? Or if I'm going to build different consumers, uh, different layout builders for different consumers, how do third party consumers do this? Like they don't have a hand on the server and you probably don't want them to have. Um, but also, and most importantly, is that there is no concept of a page in the server for the couple world. So we have, as Drupal people, we have this cognitive bias to think about a node corresponds to a page, right? And uh, that, that is not true. Like a page is whatever that React app defines as a set of templates or that iOS app de defines as their presentation. Right? And it may be that those templates are for a single entity, but there is no guarantee of that. They could be pulling different sets of data and items of data. So defining a layout for a page in the server is very difficult when you don't even have the ability to define what a page is. And again, leverage your constraints. Maybe you can say, for my project, a node is a page, and then build on that. All right, um, so one of the solutions that we could build is uh, to have some way of defining consumers and assign configuration to that. That's something that, uh, for instance, uh, Facebook does. Uh, they allow you to go to developer.facebook.com and register an app. So in Drupal, we also have that. Um, there is the consumers project. Uh, I created this for the consumer image styles, uh, which allows you to put, select the image styles for each consumer, uh, so you don't have to load them all uh, in different situations. Um, so you just register your consumer and then assign some, some configuration, maybe with the layout builder. Um, I don't know, but I'm very interested in learning what your, uh, what your experiences are with it. And if someone gets to build this, um, I'm very happy to help review and maybe even work on that. And we're moving now to user authentication. Uh, some may be surprised uh, that this is a hard problem uh, because like, it's been working forever for us in Drupal, right? And it's been a solved problem. And other communities have struggled with this, but we have not. It, is, it has been working great. Um, but we've been doing authentication using cookies, which is something that, the, again, the browser is a pretty complicated thing that does a lot for us. And one thing that does for us, it slaps a cookie on your request, depending on the domain. It works across subdomains. It encrypts cookies, so they are secure. You, you can share state. Uh, with those, so there is a lot that we can do with that. But when you have an app that runs in a Roku, for instance, you don't have this, right? So if we want to do authentication that works across consumers, we need to go to OAuth2. And this is the specification that the industry is using. Like, there is little discussion about that. There are others. They also work, but this is the leading one. And the good thing about it is that it is solving many of the problems that you, that you have. Um, again, this is a diagram that I didn't write. Uh, please don't turn to, to read it. Um, the idea is that OAuth 2 has the concept of grants. And uh, it's based on, uh, the authentication is based on the server generated a token that the consumer stores and then every time that wants to prove that uh, this is for user 43, 
then it just uses that token in the request. The problem becomes how to get that token from the server. Because it's going to be different if you have a, an Angular app and uh, you have to authenticate a user because you just do what you're used to, right? Uh, I, I think of this like the GitHub example. You click the sign with GitHub and you get redirected to github.com. You put your password there if you're not already logged in and it asks for approval and then it, you get redirected back to the other side uh, with, a, with a code in the URL that that site reads and then generates a token for you and you get it. So it's a kind of a complicated process that happens, but it requires human interaction. Uh, that's called the, uh, the authoriz authorization code grant. And uh, this diagram helps you uh, with deciding, do I need this one or not? Because it could be that you're writing a Java application that is a daemon that runs on a server and uh, every cron execution needs to make authenticated requests to Drupal, right? And for that, you don't have a user to click around and put their password. You could argue that you didn't even have a user at all because it's just a machine, right? So for that, you would use the client credentials. Um, so this seems very complicated to execute, but since this is, a, this is a standard and most importantly, a leading standard, there are lots of tools, lots of documentation that go with this. And also this particular implementation OAuth 2 is based on JWTs, uh, which is when I was saying passing a token uh, back and forth, is not just a random string. It's a JSON document that contains information about the user that is encrypted with an encryption uh, pair. So you have a set of keys, you encrypt that JSON document, and that's the token that you share around. So you can do creative things, like if you have a Node.js proxy in there, you could share those uh, set of encryption keys and decrypt the token and say, oh, well, this is actually not a valid token. I'm not even bo gonna bother Drupal with this. Or you could say, oh, I see that this is a valid token for user 77, and user 77 doesn't go to Drupal. That's, it goes to whatever external service. So you can, you can also use this uh, underlying JWT technology to do all the interesting things. Like for instance, and this is something that is already happening, uh, doing single sign-on solutions. There are two different teams right now that building on this module, they are providing single sign-on solutions. One of those is also another standard called Open Connect, uh, which again, you can leverage to connect, uh, to just sign in in your iOS app and be signed in your, in your web service, in, in your web, web app. So uh, don't be stressed. Uh, there is a lot of documentation I wrote, I, I recorded, uh, a set of videos to kind of help with the process of how do I use this grant or how do I debug that my token is being processed correctly and also the stuff like uh, that we didn't comment on like scopes, what you can do because you can limit what the user can do uh, using OAuth and, and all that. So go and check that channel and, uh, and see those videos. You can also uh, install Contenta and there is a knowledge tab that links to all those videos. Uh, and that is pretty much uh, it. But yeah, there are many other hard problems. Uh, like for instance, some, something that you did not expect maybe is that project management gets more complicated because you, instead of having one web team, now you have one iOS team, one Android team, then also one web app team and the backend team to, to manage and they all have scrums. So you have now five scrums and then you have a scrum of scrums to coordinate what they have in common. And also you may have three different ticketing systems and like it, it, it may not be a big issue, but it is just an example that when you're jumping into a new thing, you're gonna find small nuances like this that you need to solve, 
right? So your process may be impacted and you need to figure it out to be productive. Um, another hard problem, and this may be the hardest one that I've mentioned, is API versioning. Uh, I say that it's the hardest one because I'm almost convinced that it cannot be implemented in Drupal to a point that it works in every single scenario. So again, leverage your constraints and try to uh, make it work for you. But imagine that you have a version one of the API that contains a content type with a field that you want to remove for version two, right? So you go ahead and you delete the, the field from Drupal and it's gone. And it's gone with all the implications. It's gone from the database. So if a request comes in and tries to load that content type, data for that content type, the data is not there, right? You removed it from version one as well. And there is no good solution. And that is not the only problem with versioning. Like there are all the problems like making small changes in the, in the content model can have rippling effects that are very difficult to undo when you maintain backwards compatibility. Um, but there are proposals to, uh, to make versioning work within some given constraints. So we'll see where, where, that, where that lands. Content preview, um, we talked about that uh, a little bit yesterday in the Decouple Summit. It is very hard. Um, the workspaces project um, of content staging that was mentioned today in the in the Drizzt note, and the the fact that you can set some content together and then see how it works in Drupal, it doesn't mean that it's easy to do in six different um, in six different consumers. It's it's hard, especially because you need some level of authentication that may be exclusive for the preview system, right? You have a read-only application that all of a sudden needs authentication because you need to preview content. So you need to plan a little bit for that, especially when you're doing estimations and budgeting for the project. Search, uh, search can also be uh, problematic because um, it doesn't follow the same conventions of the rest of the entities. You could write a fake entity that wraps search results, right? And then use JSON API to interact with that. But I would recommend that instead you go and index your, your search into things like, for instance, Elasticsearch or Apache Solar, and then use those APIs to get your search instead of going to Drupal, go directly to the to the search uh, to the search index. But you lose all the thi all the good things that the search API module uh, does, like the facet the facet searching and all the widgets that allow a good searching experience. So you got to build that, uh, which is not a big deal because if you are into decoupled, you have to be into building things, and. You're gonna be building a lot of things from scratch. <laughs> and that's pretty much it. Uh, this presentation took a lot of effort. Uh, I practiced this presentation twice this morning before I did this. Uh, <laughs> so all, all that to say that it would be great if you took a minute to go to the DrupalCon uh, session node, click into the evaluate, and uh, you could even do it now if you want. <laughs> and yeah, uh, we have a little bit of time for questions, um, but I wanted to take the chance to say that I'm gonna be on uh, the Lullabot booth uh, at noon, uh, answering any other questions that are lingering or that you want to ask later or that we don't have time to, to answer. So with that, do we have any questions? And please walk to the, to the mic and stay in line, because otherwise the, the questions will not be recorded for the video. All right, I wonder if you can hear me fine. 
How about now? Okay, perfect. All right. Uh, very nice presentation. Uh, I came in a slightly late, but I'm wondering if you covered stream wrappers in sort of hard problems. It seems like stream wrappers are sort of there, but they are not quite general enough. I'm not sure I understand what you mean by stream wrappers. Can you elaborate on that? So there is a notion of uh, handling files in Drupal, right? Typically, those stream wrappers are just meant for public and private file systems. Architecturally, you can write your own stream wrapper and say, hey, Lullabot is a stream wrapper, and it can do magical things, whatever you want it to do, but things don't necessarily work. Uh, things are still tied in the core to the paths. They don't convert the URIs to you know, the paths and things like that, and I'm, I'm wondering if if you encounter that in the decoupled scenario? What I, can, what I can say is that it has been an outstanding problem handling files in, in decoupled so far. Um, but some really big improvements have landed in the, in the last versions of, of Drupal core. Um, the most important is that we can now upload file binaries uh, in the most impressive ways. Like you can upload just a single pixel image or you can upload a, a file of five gigabits. And you're not even limited for the PHP uh, memory limit. So that is one improvement. Another improvement is that um, files now have the, the ability to uh, to unwrap the, uh, the stream wrapper and provide a download URL when you normalize the, the entity. And that works for the stream wrappers that come with core, like basically public and private. I'm not sure if those would work with, uh, no, okay. Um, probably Wim can provide more This is going in core? It's going in the CDN module. I'm going to repeat that for, for the mic. Um, can, can you tell me your name? Sorry. Or, or maybe Wink can. So yeah, that's, that's Brad Jones, uh, who's working with me on the CDN module. But the CDN module is kind of a separate problem space, I think. I don't think you were necessarily interacting with CDNs. But it's a lot of the same thing, so come and talk to us. All right, perfect. Sure, but um, I think what you're asking is whether stream wrappers other than public and private are actually supported just fine in normalizations of uh, your data. Is that what you're asking, really? Uh, in Drupal 8.5, we added, um, we improved the way that file entities uh, represent URIs. Um, and it now automatically is going to expose a property on the URI field that contains a publicly accessible URL, so an HTTP URL. Um, for whatever stream wrapper you have. So as long as your stream wrapper implements the interface correctly, um, things are going to work fine. And as long as you're not using custom modules that do things wrong, right. things are going to work fine. In Drupal core, all of this should be working fine already. If that's not the case, then please file a bug report. Because as far as I know, that there's, there is no bug reports around this being horribly broken or broken in any way. Um, and I have to admit that in general, stream wrappers is not something that is very widely used. Maybe that is why, but that's exactly why we need you to file bug reports if you encounter that. I think there's a longer conversation. We yeah, need cool. Thank you. So that was Wimlier's API First Initiative co-coordinator. Um, I think, I don't know if that was uh, captured by the mic, that the summary of it is that um, I was not sure if uh, we supported other stream wrappers other than public and private, but it seems that we do if uh, they are implemented the correct way. Great work on the session, thank you. Um, you mentioned that versioning of the API is an issue. You said that you were almost convinced that it was unsolvable in Drupal. I'm curious what is specific about this problem in Drupal that is different from any other API, it seems like 
people are dealing with versioning APIs and removing things, deprecating things from their APIs elsewhere. What's unique in your mind about Drupal in this case? Sometimes, um, and this statement is going to be very unfair, uh, but sometimes I reduce Drupal to a content modeling tool, which means that you click together like uh, very complex uh, content models. That gets translated into a content store, and that can be either just a database, a set of databases that work together, and, and all that. So, but we only have one of those, and we don't have a great way to version the store and at the same time, maintain all the feature sets that we expect from Drupal. So uh, the example that I gave was when you remove a content type for version two, it's gone. So you need to, uh, to get a little bit more creative on your solution and you, you need to uh, stop editing your content model so you can keep this uh, API versioning, but to me that goes against what I think that Drupal is good at, which is like creating content models. So you're freezing the content model at some point and you cannot touch it anymore and then do all the stuff to maintain the, the API versioning. Is there no way to deprecate a field or content type in like a version two and then remove it completely in version three. It seems like I'm asking about the, in, the intermediate state where in my example, you're just talking about version one and version three. Is that possible? It, if you keep the Drupalisms in place, it could be done. Uh, like you could have a property on a field uh, that says if it's deprecated or not. You could even have like configuration entity that informs which fields are deprecated or not. And that could even go into the API response. Right? Say this field is deprecated, stop using it, because it's gonna go away in the next major version. But the thing is that when it goes away, it doesn't go away in the next major major version. It goes away for all of the versions because you removed it from, from the database. But yeah, you could, you could deprecate things and discourage use of. Thank you. Hello. Um, thank you so much for your presentation. It was great. I have, my question is about routing. Um, you mentioned the decoupled router module, which sounds great. Uh, my question is basically, the route becomes the, the first class query in, in every request. And, does, and, and the decoupled routes module just handles the right, hands the right entity over to me? Yes, that's, that's it. Um, it doesn't hand the entity, it hands uh, the URL that you need to request because the decoupled router is unopinionated of the API that you're using, uh, so it can give you the entity ID, the JSON API URL, but also it can give you the REST core URL. So uh, that's why it doesn't give you the response right away, because it doesn't know which API you're using. Does that performance implication? Uh, yeah, but, uh, but you can use sub-requests to bundle the next two together. But it is, uh, this is actually something that it was re requested as a feature request in the issue queue to just return the response. And maybe it is that we need to do that because, I don't know, it feels like sub request should handle that to me. Thank you. You're welcome. Can you take the last question outside? Oh, sorry. Um, I just realized that we are out of time. Um, well, I didn't realize they had to tell me. Um, but do you mind taking the question at I'll noon? Talk to you, yeah. Right. Um, again, if you want to continue the Q&A, come to the Lullabad booth, booth 100, and we'll keep this going. Thank you. Did you like it? Yeah.
Nice. So about the version, I want to talk about that because I have some